So, uh, Jennifer Korosevic is the next presenter. Um, she's going to take us to Chicago. Uh, Jennifer, Jennifer is a dual degree student, uh, just like Robert. Uh, she's doing a dual degree in architecture, Master of Architecture and Master of Real Estate Development. Uh, her project is going to be at Dye Works, an uh, eco-friendly development on the southern branch of the Chicago River. Um, her thesis chair was Jana Vandergoot. Uh, her committee members were Madeline Simon, uh, Margaret McFarlane, representing real estate development, and myself. I thought she was leaving. <laughs> All you, yeah, she's going to make me present the project. That would be just a disaster. Anyhow, it's all here. There you go. All yours. All right. Thank you, Professor Kelly. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Before I present to you my thesis proposal, I'd first like to thank everyone who was involved in helping make this project a reality. I would go through a list of names, but I think I'm just going to have to buy a lot of drinks later. <laughs> Uh, specifically, I'd like to thank my family who are FaceTiming in today from Chicago. Um, I'd like to thank my peers for their support, um, and especially my committee, most importantly, Jana Vandergoot, um, for seeing the potential and the capability both in myself and in this project. So, thank you for that. And with that, I present to you Public Dye Works. Public Dye Works is an eco-friendly textile dyeing facility on the south branch of the Chicago River that treats and filters stormwater to create a new kind of public space. And the design accomplishes this through four major design strategies. The first is viewing the design as part of a larger ecological system of inputs and outputs. The second is using water to choreograph the movement of people through the design, both at the scale of the site and at the scale of the building. The third is to take moments of intense processing, both at the industrial scale and at the community scale, and to turn these into the primary public spaces. And the last is to view the design as a catalyst for future development of this industrial corridor. Now, I'm really excited to delve into the details of the project, but before we jump into the design, I'd like to share with you some of the research that informs it. Uh -huh. So, my kind of town, Chicago. Um, this thesis takes place in Chicago, as, and I view it as a case study. So, while this design works for the south branch of the Chicago River, the idea of eco-industries, I believe, especially through this program, can be applied to cities elsewhere. But what I found fascinating about Chicago is that the history of the city is very much linked to the history of its river. And to quote a local historian, Libby Hill, Chicago owes its existence to the Chicago River, and the river owes its present form to Chicago. So when people first came to Chicago, they found the image to the far right. It was this creek that was not even worthy of being a river at all. But people modified the river, both intentionally and unintentionally, um, to make Chicago the industrialized metropolis that we know it as today. However, these modifications had unintended consequences for example, the image to the middle shows an image of Buckley Creek, which is the south fork of the Chicago River. However, because of the pollution that went into the river and the methane bubbles from that pollution, we called it Buckley Creek, and they still do today. You can find this creek and much of the industry in the core of Chicago's industrial heart, which is on the lower west side. Uh, roughly three miles southwest of the downtown loop along the Chicago River. And Chicago uh, initially was made up of three main industries which came in this order, starting with grain, then lumber, and then the meat packers, which we are more familiar with the meat packers through Upton Sinclair's novel The Jungle and the way he detailed the meat packing industry. 
Interestingly enough, these various industries set up shop at different locations along the river to suit their needs. The meat packers were down here at the mouth of Bubbly Creek, and the lumber mills were along canal slips to the north and silos along the main branch as well. All of these industries utilized the river as a transportation source before rails came. Once I delved into the history, I wanted to learn more about the present condition of the site and delved into site analysis. While industry has traditionally been on the lower west side, today it is industry keeps its place on the river because of a protected zoning overlay called a plan manufacturing district. Many cities have these, but they're uh, called by different names and what these plan manufacturing districts do is set up a defined corridor where no residential uses are allowed and what these corridors do is fragment the urban fabric in patches around the city most noticeably here along the south branch of the river and these industries have modified the course of the river over time i was fascinated to find out that the river that we see today in Chicago was not the river that's always been there. Parts have been removed, added, subtracted over time in order to um, fit the needs of the changing industries there. But industry isn't the only effect on the river, or cause of effect on the river. Today, actually, people are the main cause of pollution in the river, which I was surprised to find out. Because of Chicago's uh, dated sewer system, which utilizes a combined sewer overflow system. And with even two thirds of an inch of rain, the city's stormwater and sewer water combine and overflow into the river, dumping billions of gallons into the river every year. And industry has traditionally liked this area of the river because of the way that different flows of transportation parallel the river. You have rail, expressways, the river. However, uh, pedestrian movement has not been accounted for. And this was the basis for the urban design proposal. So one of my first design moves was to propose a new urban scheme that would um, address three main ideas. The first was setting up a system of four main eco-industrial parks that create a cross-axis on the Chicago River. These eco-industries are connected by a continuous river walk, and pollution is addressed by creating around the various combined sewer overflow outlets, sedimentation bays that would filter out the heavy sediments. Oops, went too early. So once I had set up this system of four eco-industrial sites, I knew that the design intention architecturally was to create an industry for water. And I did that, or in thinking about that water industry, it helped me inform which of these four sites to choose for the architectural intervention. And out of the four sites, this one here, had the most unique opportunity in terms of its water access and promontory um, placing at this opening of the Chicago River. So this site at 2453 South Laughlin, a number that's burned into my mind now, is a 10 and a half acre parcel that's currently used for asphalt mixing, concrete reduction, recycling, bulk material storage, really boring, not fun industrial uses. And I assumed that these industrial uses, which go back at least 30 years, have made the site uh, a brownfield, field which would require environmental remediation, which I will discuss later. One of the unique challenges about this site, though, is its location at the dead end of this street. And I first thought about, all right, well, if I'm going to make this really cool design at the end of this point, how am I going to get people from the main street here at CERMAP all the way down to my site where all the fun stuff's happening. And that's where the site design strategy comes into play. In the site design, I set up a system of infrastructure. This infrastructure includes new utility lines, including gas, water lines, and electric lines, 
uh, as well as green infrastructure, including street trees and bioswales, to create a grid system that would influence future development of the site. Most especially, the bioswales would use water to guide people from Cermet Road down to the site at the point. And these biofills would collect and filter stormwater down to the site that could be used in the dive works. What's really unique about this parceling system, though, is the future development potential that it has. Um, these system of, system of parcels could influence future development um, in, as me being the master developer, I would propose a form-based code of different building configurations that future developers could partner with me in developing the rest of the site, such as bar buildings, U-shaped buildings, or courtyard buildings that could align to various programmatic uses. So now that I've thought about how do I get people from up top down to my site, it was time to delve into the design of the actual building. And I knew that I wanted to create a water-based industry. And the first industry that came to mind was textile dyeing. An interesting quote that I came along was, critics say you can tell the next season to you by the colors of the rivers in China. Which I found to be interesting because water in the textile dyeing process is supposed to be colorful. That's how you know that textile dyeing is happening. But we associate this color, especially in this picture, which could remind one of a river of blood, it's actually pollution. Um, so when we see this water, we're seeing toxic chemicals and thinking of a negative connotation, when in reality, this colored water can be seen as something beautiful. And in industrial dye works, it very much relies on being a synthetic process of using these chemicals in order to create long-lasting colors. It's mechanized and it's concealed. And I can guarantee you I've never seen any of these images before I started researching this project. Because we know nothing about this industry. However, traditionally, the textile dyeing process has been one that's used non-toxic plants as the dyeing base. It's been very communal and it's part of the public space. So one of the first steps that I began in this process was visualizing how textile dyeing happens and how I could redesign this for a more ecological future. So I began, began by creating a series of collages that visualize this process. The process begins with harvesting the plants used in the dime, and then extracting the color from them through baths, um, which, like over a period of time, in baths of boiling, warm boiling water. Then the fabric is added, and you soak the fabric over a period of time to achieve the certain color or hue that you want in the fabric. You stop the process by removing the fabric, rinsing it, and then hanging the fabric up to dry. And this collage here was the foundation of how the dye works began. So in thinking about harvesting as the first part of the process, one of the first spaces that I designed was the growing fields. And that's one of the main public spaces of the dye works where people can walk amongst the fields of poppy, lavender, and buttercup, and actually see the plants that are being used within the facility. I knew that the whole system of the textile dyeing process had to be involved in the building, and harvesting had to happen on site, and not just elsewhere. You can access these growing fields at the lower end of the site by water, but people can also approach the site from the north along the new site design that I've proposed. And one of the first spaces that you enter when you get to the dye works is the bolt library. And this bolt library is both the beginning and the end of the process. You see these, on either side of you, you see these large shelving units which have the dye works' public collection of its recent projects. And you're further pulled into the facility from the view of the extraction vials, which you can see in this section here. 
And these extraction vials is where the extraction of the color happens. So the plants from the growing fields are put into these vials to take the color from them. And there are these large chemistry vials that have floating plants and color in them that you can see. So while you have these vials to your left, to the right, simultaneously, you see the loading theater, which puts the service functions of the building on public display so people can see trucks coming and going, bringing fabric in and out of the dye works facility. You're then pulled into the main dyeing hall, which is the large courtyard space of the dye works. And in here, you can see all parts of the dyeing process on public display. You can see terraces of various plants that can be grown all year long because as we know Chicago only has like a three month growing season it's so cold there. You can also see the um, extraction shoots and these shoots are where you can see all the fabric floating in them and you're guided through the courtyard by pipes above you and these pipes have colored water in them which connect the extraction vials to the soaking chutes. And these pipes further guide you down the courtyard to the final space of the dye works, which is the drying house, which I consider to be the temple of the dye works. And in this large warehouse space, all of the colored fabrics are finally hung to dry. And you can see all this colored fabric hanging above you, which you just want to touch, just like that. But more importantly, you see the view out to the river. You see the growing fields in front of you, the beautiful meadows of flowers and color, and you're pulled out back into the growing fields once again, where you find yourself at both the beginning and the end of the process simultaneously. I believe the beauty of the dye works lies in its multi-layered use, and the fact that it can be not just a textile dyeing facility, but it's a water treatment facility. Its value lies in its infrastructural value, not to mention the amount of public space that's created on the river in the form of the new parks, both outside and inside the facility. This thesis began by looking at the fragmented fabric of this industrial corridor in Chicago and wanting to connect people to the river. And I believe what this thesis accomplishes is creating a new form of public space that allows industry to remain in the city for an ecological, sustainable future while creating a new kind of public space. And with that, I'd like to open up the floor for comments and discussion. Right, that other building. <laughs> I almost forgot to mention the other component of uh, the project, which is the color lab. Um, you can see specifically in this section over here that the Color Lab functions as an extension of the dye works. And what the Color Lab is, it's a maker space so that anyone in this room can come to the, once you're done visiting the dye works and seeing the dye process, you can go play with the dyes yourself within the Color Lab and um, either play with dyes, experiment with dyes, or take the colored fabric from the dye works and transform it into uh, fashion or other textile products. And with that, I'd like to now open up for <laughs> comments and discussion. Interesting. You know, I've been teaching a long time, and I don't think I've ever encountered a program for dye works, so I have absolutely no idea what, what it was involved. So it's very educational. So to see a different kind of program. I am, so my questions have to do a little bit about how you think it works. Does the public just come and wander around? Do they have guided tours? Um, are you expecting tour buses? Uh, I'm just curious the kind of functionality of the program as a, as a public agenda since you're, you're emphasizing the public aspect of this, what I presume is a corporate private enterprise. Mm -hmm. I mean, somebody owns it like Dow, Dow Chemical or DuPont. Um, and so that's one question. And the second question has to do with how you deal with the residual effluent of all the colored dyes. They don't get dumped back in the river. Presumably you read the water gets purified in some way. So is there a, is there a, a I know you had vats where you want to 
let it let the dyes be mixed, but how do you get rid of the color when you're done? Excellent question. <laughs> so, first question, public being able to come to the building. Uh, one of the ways that I envisioned this building functioning is almost like a museum, where when you come into the entrance, you, know, you walk in, it's like, hello, I've come to the dye works, and you come to the front desk, and you mention to someone that you'd like to tour the facility, like you can't just like wander in. So there has to be some form of checkpoint, right, with all the wonderful security we have these days. Um, but from there, there would be guided tours of the facility. Um, but one of the spaces which I enjoyed, which was this large courtyard space, I saw as being almost like a botanical garden or a conservatory that people could come and see things on display. Um, so. Are, are you aware, do you have any memory or are you aware of that wonderful photograph that always appears in travel brochures from Morocco where the dye, the dye pits are out front and it's in the public square mm -hmm. and it always seems to me like this, you know, you're making a huge greenhouse for dye pits, which would be great. Um, but second question, how do you, I mean, there's a whole other recycling issue, isn't it? Is it on site or do you just, hopefully it gets taken away and recycled somewhere else? Right. So, I, in the way that I designed this was that the water would get filtered throughout the building. Um, again, we're using plants for the dyeing base, so we're not using any chemicals. So the, the water doesn't have any toxicity to it. Um, but for example, if we refer to this diagram here, you go from the extraction vials and that water can then filter down into the growing terraces. So the plants are used as a way to filter the color out of the water. And then once you bathe the fabric in the dye, the fabric is taking some of that color out. Um, none of the water that's going through the dye works I envisioned would be used for like drinking or anything. Most of the water going, <laughs> Maybe. We'll test that when it actually is built. <laughs> but I envisioned that the water that goes through would mostly be used for irrigation of the growing fields or reused in the facility. I could, a lot, lot less common than we'll turn this over. I would imagine you could design the gardens outside in the same manner as you're designing the, the functionality of the plant, where the, the water gets bled into various pools and gets cleaned as it goes down through filter systems of gravel and plants and so forth. I'm sure that there's some federal agency that will not allow you to let it get into the river. Uh, so you have to make sure that it doesn't. Um, but it could be part of the land, exterior landscape as well as a, as a formal system of filter, filtration. Right. Which would add to the complexity of the, of the uh, scheme. Anyway, thank you. I'm, it's nice to learn something. <laughs> uh, I agree. It's, it's the first time I've seen a facility like this, and it's interesting to learn how this works. Um, I, I immediately started thinking of various uh, botanical garden projects. Um, our office actually worked on the Queen's Botanical Garden, and um, there are similar issues tackled here. And I just wonder if you could maybe talk about or, or things to think about in the future of how the architecture could kind of celebrate that use of water um, and how you're sharing it with everyone. I know you described the pipe works and whatnot, but when you get to the end of that process, you know, you will have this sort of gray water that you could then recycle and bring back to the head of the building and kind of demonstrate to people that this is kind of a continuous loop and that, you know, no one should ever believe that this is getting dumped again in the river, right? So I think there's some ideas about how you're tracking those systems through the building, but I wish I could see something in the architecture that kind of connects the loop back again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a big fountain, or you know, you show the start of water kind of hitting the roof like you're collecting storm water, but um, what happens to it at the end of the building, and is there a way to bring it back again? Mm -hmm. Is that something you, you thought about how the water works in that way? Right. Yes. I think for the most part, yes, I did. So let me take a stab at this. Show the, the cistern in your section where it's filtering down. Right. <laughs> so, uh, one of the ideas for celebrating the water was, or in reusing it, was 
again, more pipe design and systems design than I fully got to flesh out, but some of the water could be used to irrigate the plants in the field. Some of the water would be stored and collected in the underground cistern. And I was imagining, if we look at one of the plants here, um, I'm not that tall, but <laughs> it's north of the drying house. There's like a large rinsing pool. Um, and I was imagining that you could understand where the cistern was by like, the floor pattern below you. Um, like a hatching, not a hatching, that's a drawing term. <laughs> but like the tiling of the floor so you can understand where the system would be. Um, so that's one part for the reuse through the building. The other would be like the bioswales, for example. Uh, and using the bioswales as a way to track the movement of water throughout the site uh, to show that once you get down here, uh, that the bioswale could lead you back to the street where then you're led back up to the beginning of the building again. Uh, I think it's an extremely interesting project, uh, well developed, well presented, and uh, somehow it fits in that category of the architecture for industry, or at least uh, an architecture that has to give shape to something that has to function extremely well. At the same time, you are able to propose the idea that this industry could become really like a, a, a learning experience for many, uh, museum-like, uh, something that you know you can go there to visit and uh, learn about color, fashion. I can see you know how, how, how many people could be interested in this visit. At the same time, it is uh, again, you know, fits in that category in which industry and architecture gets together. For example, another type that is now very, uh, let's say, fashionable in many ways is the winery. You know, it works. Ah, yes. that way. You know, the, the winery as a process and so on. But in the winery, what there is, there is an enologist, there is a, a industrial or the guy that owns it that somehow establish how the system should work, then the architect has to understand and interpret that system and give shape to it and give, uh, and give a, the soul uh, an invent element. I think you did a good job in many ways because in the renderings you show the importance that you give to the spaces, to the sensation of being in a place that is not just uh, functional, you know, it's more than that. And uh, at the same time, would I like to see more maybe a wall section through those buildings, you know, to see how uh, the energy works or the light uh, through the, the glass, because it seems everything very transparent, but it, it, it's, it's, it's more like a schematic drawing, you know, like this element here, what is a shed building, mm -hmm. does it relate to the industrial, uh, forms that could be found around the area. You know, there is all this industrial archaeology uh, uh, world that is incredible and is really worth to, to develop. Is this structure steel structure or do you use maybe concrete elements? Do you, you know, what I'm saying is, uh, I, would, I would like you to talk a little bit more about also, as an architect, once you're given this project, what do you present, what do you propose? On the other side, I think this idea are all very good, very important, and it's good that they come from an architect, in a way, <laughs> and a real tour at the same time, so that I can see how, how the, the synergy works in a, in a very nice way, and it could become really a, a great place as a model for other areas and reuse of the areas industrial. So I think you really did an, an incredible job. Your, your drawings are beautiful. I mean, they're just uh, beautiful. We can see really a plan, how it works, maybe because the walls are black and so on. It helps a little bit from a distance. Uh, I think the landscape maybe could have been uh, a little bit more clarified, which are the paths. Uh, it is homogeneous, or there are places where you want to stop, maybe something that deals a little bit more with the water, or how the water touches the ground, and these type of things. But 
I think it's an incredible project, really beautiful. Thank you. I agree. <laughs> I think it's a the simple elegance of the project comes uh, 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 through your drawings. Um, I think that one of the things that I, I kept wondering about and knowing Chicago, and you did touch on the point of the climate, what happens with the growing fields in the winter and in those mo in those months when uh, the fields have basically died? And do you envision, uh, since this this uh, the building is is year round, I would imagine. What happens with uh, the exterior spaces? And then another point is, or another question is, Chicago. I, I believe in March, you know, with um, uh, what is it, St. Patrick's Day, they they dye the river. Um, would that be possible here? You know, you screen up up river. But some of the colors that are coming out from the, the process, you know, since you said this isn't a chemical, there aren't chemicals involved. Do you envision that that could happen to just um, further celebrate what's happening in, in inside the building? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the first question was about the fields in the winter. The way that I envisioned these meadows was or growing fields, meadows, was like the wildflower prairies out in the Midwest, where it's a combination of grasses and flowers. So when the winter comes, sure the field dies, but you still have the grasses there that create this like beautiful like golden yellow color to them. And it is a park space, so it's still it's still interactive to that to that extent. Um, and maybe there'd be hardier flowers that would be planted as well that would function in winter. Because you don't use just flowers in the dyeing process. You can use tree bark, you can use uh, like avocado skins, skins of fruits and leaves and stems. So the, to answer that question, I think even if there's not colorful flowers, you can still see an uh, example of the different plants being used in the dyeing process. The other question had to do with the dyeing of the river, which I think it's funny because I was reading an article in the research. There's an organization called Friends of the Chicago River, and they were harping on the river being dyed, and now they use like vegetable dyes for the green dyeing of the river, but they still see that as like something that's not good for the river. So while maybe I don't want to put any dye or plant dyes into the water, there could be events that would be held inside the facility. Okay, um, a, a few questions again for me. Um, how effective is, I assume this is totally organic, right? How effective is this commercially compared to a chemical process? How viable is this? Did you have a chance to research that or you just said, going to go ahead and make this organic and sustainable and all of that? Uh, so there, there are large companies that do organic dyeing or eco dyeing. However, of course, it's no surprise they're all in Europe <laughs> uh, that do type, like eco textile dyeing on a larger scale uh, for clothing manufacturers. No one in the U.S. does it. People that do eco dyeing are all smaller artisan shops. So part of my narrative, especially from the development aspect, because I have to present this again in a few days, <laughs> from the development aspect, I viewed it as it's a the company here is a conglomeration of multiple smaller artists that said, "Hey, why are we doing this? Like, as a small business, where you know the power of three is better than the power of one, and come together and use our pool our resources to have something bigger and better." So that's step one. But the other aspect is. I think the culture here, not here in the building, but like amongst the population is changing that people want to know where their products come from. There's a thing called GOTS standards, which I can't remember what the acronym stands for at the moment, but it's all about sustainable manufacturing and knowing that knowing where your stuff comes from. So I believe it's a growing trend and people are going to want to invest more in these sustainable products. So it's like with solar panels. 
Solar panels used to be super expensive and nobody wanted them, but now they're so cheap, everyone's putting them on their houses. But, but this is an industrial scale, what you're proposing, and it's not sort of three mom and pop right. sort of groups uh, coming together. Um, so I, I just wanted to just try to understand how does it, how can this compete, you know, with the chemical process for doing this. Um, the interesting thing, though, is that what, what you've done is to set up what basically is the, the art of this process. And I think that's really interesting. Um, I'm someone, I, I don't drink alcohol, but I've been to vineyards all over the world, South Africa, Australia, the West Coast, France, Italy, just for the process. It's just kind of cool. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's a little weird to those people when I go there and I'm not testing, you know, tasting it, but I like seeing, seeing the process. So you're, you're making that um, as part of an event, in a sense. The thing that I don't understand is that you know your fields just looks like a you know a meadow. I would think on an industrial scale, again, and compared to vineyards, there needs to be more organization in the landscape so that you know all of the lavender are sort of grouped together. You know, and that could be part of the aesthetic of, of how you set this up. Not unlike the screens, not unlike how you've hung those things here uh, um, above. So I think there's a certain rigor that maybe is missing to take it to the next level. Um, and also, uh, as was mentioned before, the architectonic quality of the buildings aren't quite expressed just yet. And that's, that's you know, part of your dual degree is the architecture and the real estate um, part of it. Uh, I, I sort of question, how did you decide on the plots of all of the spaces that are, I don't know if that's to the north or not, but the, the breakdown of the development until you get to your site, it looks like maybe they're a little bit less than two acres each developable plot. Was there any decision on the size of those in relationship to the proposed buildings, or did it just look good doing one, two, three, four, five, six of those? Or? Well, it does look good, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, All right, but real estate wise, you know, are those practical right. plots? So, I divided up the grid system. There was an existing parceling system. There were uh, parcel lines set up like about every hundred feet. So the infrastructure is every hundred feet. One hundred or two hundred? One hundred or two hundred feet. I think the parcels are about two hundred. That's not right. No, that's right. My, in my delirious state, I'm like, what are those numbers again? Anyways, it was, basically, it was based on a system already set up in place. I also knew that my site went up to the extent outlined there. Um, so I divvied up the site into two even parcels. However, I also saw that it's like, it's just a parceling system, so one developer could, in theory, buy sure. you know, sure, six of them. That. What's the 10 acres? The entire thing, or just your part? The 10 acres is this whole black outlined border there. Including that? Including these two northern ones. Okay. Um, the buildings that you've broken down, do you have any idea of the square footage of the footprint of those? Yes, I do, but it's been a while since I looked okay. at the numbers, because I did calculate them. And, and again, uh, I'm, I'm only asking these things because you're doing both architecture and real estate, so I think we can sort of pick on you and the yeah. previous guy a little bit more in those sort of real world things because you really have to deal with that. And, um, it, you know, um, this, okay, so that's how you get down to the site. I think the sort of canal or channel, you know, maybe you could have emphasized what happens there. That could be part of the process that there's some building at the end or port or something that part of the process is not to go down the street down the middle but to get on a boat or barge or whatever and get to this end of the site. So uh, I think this is, this is great and then it's just to push it to the next level because you are doing real estate and architecture. Yeah, if I was here for another month, we could get all this done. <laughs> But well, I really don't want to be. It, no, 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 but it might be smart of you to continue that for your, for, no, seriously, for your portfolio and, and when you're applying for a job because 
I'm the type of person that you might be applying to that job and I'm going to ask you those questions, so why not? Because you're expected to know it. So, But uh, all in all, a great project to, to do something that's sustainable, to take a process and make it part of a, an event uh, is, is really smart. So as we keep talking about process, before so I brought all these models here, and they've been sitting in my desk, and I want to give them some love, so I'm just going to toss these out like candy, and just pass them around. Yeah, that's also a great idea, too. Everybody gets a model. You get a model, you get a model, you get a model. <laughs> Everybody gets a model. There's more models if people want a model. <laughs> we'll pass more models around. Uh, Jennifer, um, I just... Uh, <laughs> I wanted to uh, say that I'm enamored with, with the drawings. I think they're very attractive, the colors, uh, the softness, they're very artistic. Um, uh, it's wonderful to look at them, it's very, very peaceful. When I'm dissecting them from an architectural point of view, I always find it interesting uh, as falling in love with industrial facilities, industrial buildings. The reality of these facilities at, at, at these scales, they're not as poetic. Um, I actually visited not a dyeing, a color, a dye works facility, but a perfume facility in France. And I've noticed how fields with flowers are, are organized and how conveyor belts populate everything because they have to fill vats. And how the industry has a, a very systematic way um, of placing um, different um, aromatic plants in different places in, and, and how you can combine things to make perfume. I would assume to make color you need to mix things and, and the process of doing that um, requires a lot of machinery, a lot of equipment um, and that influences tremendously the form. So um, another thing that I find interesting in this thesis is your lovely meta, um, very organic, right? Everything is lavender, buttercup. Uh, to put machinery there will require an organization um, that is not as organic to collect this, unless you're gonna have people that's gonna meander around to collect things. And then I look at your plan, your urban plan here, and that is the most machine-like, the most rigid thing that I've ever seen in contrast with this. And I'm wondering, wow, you know, um, you want this to be a catalyst to bring people down, but this is like the unité d'habitation almost, that quite was not the, the success that it could have been. So I'm wondering to, uh, if you did have time and if uh, uh, it would have been interesting to actually explore form through this that maybe reverses the diagram a little bit and gives the correct form to things that need for functional reasons and the the part that you're actually creating there for future development attractive so that people come over there and say wow i do want to go to this park i do want to walk through here because right now you know it's it's very rigid and i look at these models they're great but i keep seeing uh, I've been trying to find a, a track through them that informs me of the process that you are creating and you're very different. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Thanks. Gotcha. Okay, two things. One, uh, we keep talking about the meadow. I did think about organizing the flowers and, and placing them so you can see in the large aerial an axon, even though it looks like impressionist painting like and very blurry. Uh, the placement of like poppies in specific areas to draw attention through the reds, like the lavenders would be grouped in certain areas. However, I do agree that 
we were to work on this for a little bit longer, I would have, and I intended to get into more detail with the landscape design plan. Um, when, in terms of the models, these were part of the process early on, and these models imply, not imply, employ three different materials. There's a armature structure, which is the wood, there's chipboard as an opaque material, and then the plexi is a clear material. And initially, I'm trying to find which one was even like one of the first models. I think I left it at this. <laughs> but some of the initial models were trying to employ ribbons with a wrapping form and thinking about how the wood armature structure could uh, point to views or an axis and the plexi would be used as a way to draw attention to things. So they started uh, very rectangular with the armature reaching out to like a water tower or reaching out to the river and then they got a little bit more contained and smaller. Can I ask you a quick question? Yes. Uh, this, this central axis is very, very important in a way, you know, because it's uh, where Somehow you, you bring together the entire project, but it seems a little bit underdeveloped in terms of drawing, and especially this water tower, I think is water, so, uh, it seemed like a little, okay, there will be a water tower there, but you don't draw it, you know what I mean? You, you don't give to that tower the potential that could have as a sign seen from the distance. I don't know if, if that one, that you put there, or is there is an existing one? That's what I put there. Okay, I think as an architect you could do a little bit more. You could, you know, challenge the, the project a little bit more. Right. You know, it's interesting that you brought these models up. Spatially, these are much more interesting than your final result. Something happened somewhere uh, in, the, in the process. I mean, when I look at how inventive, you know, just the quality of some of these spaces are, I mean, then I don't know what happened. Um, so, so we all know that water is increasingly a uh, precious resource. Um, I, where does it start? I mean, where, do, where are you getting? From some place you're getting a vast quantity of water to begin your process. Mm -hmm. Are you getting it from the Chicago water system? Yes. Okay, so you get, you know, 90 million, billion gallons of water as a startup. I would uh, argue, wait a second. And then... No, it's the storm water, right? It's the storm water runoff. Right. So your bioswales are what you know, helping you gather the storm water, which overflows. Right, so that's part of it. Right, just wanted to make sure we didn't go on. So, so. Yeah. Can you please repeat that so that the people could hear it? Right. I initially said yes and thinking, okay, well, if the business opens on day one and then there's no rain for a week, then it would need water from somewhere. <laughs> but eventually, <laughs> we would be using water collected, storm water collected, and the bioswales would bringing water up from Cermak Road and these other sites along Laughlin down to my site at the point. Okay, and then, and then clarify this for me, um, because there was some discussion about dumping water, coloring the river. Are, are you in fact recycling the water? Yes. Or, so you're recycling, that was your point, Yana, about the, I don't know, the reservoir that, uh, I'm about to start finalizing, so I'll, I'll well, um, maybe you might. No, I'm not done. I, I think you underplayed what was going on in this section um, that's quite important to the process. Um, the water filters down, the plants drain it, but also you've drawn these sand settling beds. Uh, and I think right here, there's some major filtration taking place. So, um, you know, it's not all perfectly worked out tectonically. But Certainly there's the idea that, you know, just like you've shown in this system diagram, that you're taking the filtered water and you're using it again, and none of it is actually 
leaving the facility and going into the stormwater sewers again. I'm, I'm trying to reassure myself and everybody else, you understand? No. Asking these pertinent questions. Um, so it just so happens that my wife went uh, last weekend or the weekend before or something and did this little dyeing event um, where they used organic materials, leaves and stuff. Um, and she came back and reported how this activity worked. And part of the activity was taking leaves and flowers or whatever and stick them in a pot, you know, and boiling the water for about four hours with the cloth in there. So apparently one of the other things that's needed in this process, I presume, is power. So how does that work? I mean, is that power is just being delivered here off-site, or are you also doing something inside this project to deal with the power part? Uh, are those are those vi the what are you called vials? Are they are we boiling stuff and the, the organic plants and whatever in those pretty colored vials? Is that what's going on? That well, when I initially designed them, I was thinking of the soaking, and then I had neglected the the boiling aspect. But I think the beauty about some of the spaces is again there's. I got really caught up in designing the systems and understanding the process and designing all the systems that, again, like as we were talking about today, some of the architecture didn't get fully developed. Um, but I believe, like you know, that this basement loading storage area, you could change this section so that it could have a little. Not a, it's not a furnace. It's like a little stove or something underneath to Try help heat up the Br water. Brunson burner. Yes. A Brunson burner. Yeah. There we go. To okay. go with the chemistry. Model. All right, we're getting there. So, and, and it's you know it's already been said. I mean, I think, I mean, I think it's a wonderful project, and I think it's a wonderful, wonderful set of ideas to look for these kinds of essentially eco-industrial um, elements that we can introduce to these areas, which is a really positive, really positive step, you know, for society. Um, obviously, to keep going, what we need to do is to think about all the different pieces. You know, including the bees that we need out here to take care of pollinating all the flowers and you know the whole the whole loop, right? The whole kind of great loop. It's it's already been said. I'm hungry for the more specific architectonic, you know, resolution. Um, we're, we're almost all of us as architects are, in some funny way, envious of those great phenomenal industrial buildings that just look so terrific. You know, we can never quite match them. Thank you. Great. Um, well, I have to say it was super fun this semester working on this project with Jennifer. And I feel like she's one of the best kinds of students. Um, she was really open to exploring different program ideas. One of the most exciting things for me to see um, was how you took your early site analysis drawings, which were on the computer, quite beautiful, looking at the history. Um, uh, and you transformed that into a program because you knew you wanted an industry but you had no idea what industry you were going to take on and it was a brewery at one point and it, I think you were really gutsy in taking on the dye works um, and you had some faith and you really dug into it so that was awesome to see it was really wonderful to see um, I also really appreciate that you were thinking about architecture as a system as a piece of a larger system you know, so the fact that you took the time to do a, an actual system diagram where you show your buildings as part of that system, I think it's not easy to do. It's not easy to think that way. Um, and you really got into that. And I think that is partly the answer to how we can make industry fit in with these larger ecological systems, right, like hydrology. Um, I. I I really appreciated also this piece of your project. While I'm not a real estate development expert, I think what you were proposing was really a scheme for infrastructure that was somewhat open-ended. And while you have you know, example parties, this could be developed in so many amazing ways, right? And what you're doing is you're setting the framework for a kind of infrastructure that would ensure the site is treated ecologically, right? Because everybody wants to come and where I get the dye works. Yeah. Um, I'm a firm believer in, in uh, 
this, I mean, I, I think your business would take off. I think in some ways you undersold the real estate part of it by saying it's, you know, it's it's mostly a museum or a place where people could go. I actually think it could be a hardcore industry. The, this shirt that I'm wearing is dyed with vegetable dyes and I won't tell you how much I paid for it, but I, I, I do think it's a burgeoning industry. Um, people do want to, they don't want to dress their kids in clothes that are, you know, soaked in chemicals. So I think, I do think there's a real uh, real estate component there. And I hope when you present that piece of it, you really stand behind yourself. Um, but all in all, yeah, I mean, wonderful, beautiful project. I wish these plans were actually flipped with the perspectives because I think there's quite a bit of architectural detail in the plans. Um, you know, the fact that you're showing a, a theater here where people can come and sit and view. Um, your entry sequence in the monumental stair up here. I think those were, you know, you, you thought quite a bit about those things. Um, so that's all I have to say. Congratulations, and it was wonderful working with you. So we're going to take